welcome. I'm so excited for today. Uh, I think most of you know I was on Halloween Baking Championship a couple of years ago, and ever since then I always just have a lot of fun with Halloween and Halloween treats. So today we've got uh, a lot of treats ready to make for you guys. So um, I was just finishing up some prep and we are ready to go. So uh, today we are making my uh, candied apples or toffee apples, whatever you call them, or making them black so they look like Snow White's poisoned apple. Uh, so this is just really, really easy to make. Uh, we're also making some chocolate Halloween bark. Again, doesn't get much simpler than making homemade bark. Uh, and then finally, we're also going to make my pumpkin ghosts, which uh, is also incredibly simple. So we're going to make all three of these and it's not going to take too much time at all and we're going to have a ton of fun. So I'm just making sure that I can see all the comments. Sherry is here. Wonderful. Let's her post go back and let's make sure that I can see comments on Facebook and then we will get started. So if you are uh, if you are here and you're watching, go ahead and leave me a comment letting me know what your favorite thing to make for Halloween is. Uh, and then I will know that everything is working properly. We can get started. You gotta love when everything is going so slow. Uh, it's not like I'm not using the internet for three different cameras and a laptop and another laptop and a, and a phone. <laughs> All right, come on, Facebook. You can do it. It does not want to find this. All right, well, we will just get started and I will hopefully at some point be able to uh, see comments over on Facebook. All right, so for the, the apples, we're gonna start with the apples first. First thing we wanna do is take some sugar and you wanna pour it in a pot. Now, I usually when I'm filming videos, I do wider, a shallower pot so you guys can see easier, but because we're gonna be dipping apples, I went with a deeper pot. So we have the sugar. We have the water, and then we have the corn syrup. Now again, corn syrup uh, that you get at the store is not the same as high fructose corn syrup that everybody likes to freak out about. Um, and uh, it is really great for candy making. What it's gonna do is it's going to give us a nice shine uh, to our finished product, nice gloss, and it's gonna keep our sugar uh, from getting from staying granulated it helps it melt really really nicely so I'm gonna give that a stir we want that sugar to dissolve the other thing that you really need is a good thermometer whether you have one of these candy thermometers or whether you just have um, one that you like stick in your pot so we're gonna add this over here to the side oh, if I can get it attached <laughs> Some pots, this is a brand new one because I broke my one last, last week I broke my old one so I had to get a new one. The good thing is they're super, super cheap. So give this a stir. And now I'm going to actually bring it over and put it on the stove because this is going to take a while to boil to the right temperature that we want. And so I want to get it started over here while we work on another recipe. Just gotta remember to keep an eye on it. <laughs> okay. Ooh, close. close my curtain so I don't get a weird light issue. Uh -huh. All right, so while that is coming up to temperature and boiling, uh, we are going to move on and work on the bark. So, now for chocolate bark, you can use whatever colors that you want. I always make sure I use at least some pure, real quality chocolate. Um, so this is one of my favorite dark chocolates. And then I'm also using some colored chocolate. Um, and it comes like this, and there's a couple different brands, right? There's, uh, I like Merkins. I feel like they have a really great flavor and good colors, but these neon colors can be a little bit harder to find. Uh, usually you can get these at any store, and these are Wilton's. They don't have as good of a flavor in my opinion, uh, but they're giving us the right color. And you can always add uh, flavoring to these. I have candy flavoring, because candy flavoring is oil-based versus extracts, which are water-based. And so they'll mix with the chocolate without making it see. So you always wanna make sure that you're using uh, oil-based 
uh, candies when you're working with chocolate. So what we want to do is melt these. And I have a melt chocolate button on my microwave, which is pretty much the best thing ever. <laughs> so we're going to use that. Did not mean to turn my, my, my light on. Uh, in the meantime, we're going to prep our pan. So what you want to do is get a nice jelly roll pan. And uh, I have parchment paper down in mine. I just use a parchment rectangle. Now you can either cut the parchment so that it fits perfectly, or I just will bring in my nails and press it into the corners. So I have my chocolate, the real chocolate that's gonna help bring more flavor in, melted nicely. Put that aside. I have my neon green. Now oftentimes when I'm working with melted chocolate, I'll add some kind of oil to help keep it smooth and to water it down. Um, but because we want this to harden back up like a candy bar, I am not uh, going to add anything to this. It will make it a little bit thicker and a little bit more temperamental to work with, but, um, but it is worth it. So first thing that you want to do is just add plops all over, um, all over your sheet in all of the colors. Now, because we're gonna be swirling this, I don't worry too much about um, all the little drizzles, because the top is the area that I want to be pretty. So, and you can go with big plops or little plops. That is up to you. I like going with smaller plops. The reason for that is then I don't have to, um, I don't have to swirl as much, and then I don't have big blocks of one color or another in any one spot. All right, let's check on our purple. All right, so this is after the first little bit, and it's gonna definitely gonna need more time. But I do like to kind of come in here about part way through the melting process and give it a stir simply so that I'm kind of redistributing the candy melts. Okay, so the other thing that you want to do is decide what you want to top yours with. So I have a couple different options today. I have these um, Jimmy's and pumpkin faces. I have just some plain balls. I have some white little ghosts and some white skulls. The first time I made this, I used uh, white bones, but this year, and it, sprinkles are different every year. This year I couldn't find any little white bones. I could only find blood splattered white bones and I didn't want to add red into this since I'm staying with the brown, green, purple, and orange. Uh, I also usually do some black non perils but I guess I did not get those brought up this time around. <laughs> the really itty bitty teeny tiny ones because they kind of fill in any spots that don't have anything else. So I do like using some non perils in there as well. Um, oh, and eyeballs. I have candy eyeballs as well. Now most of these you can just sprinkle on top because they're uh, like even the skull, right, is double sided, right? It's a skull. Oh, come on, focus. It's a skull on both sides, so it doesn't matter, but the eyeballs are one-sided, so you wanna make sure that you don't just sprinkle those on. All right, let's check on our purple again. Uh, Sherry, you, you love making pumpkin anything. Let's see if Facebook comments are finally working. Fingers crossed. It's like it hates me. Uh, and I think it does sometimes. I bet I'm not the only one. I bet you, I bet Facebook, you feel that Facebook hates you sometimes too. Okay, here we go. It looks like, nope, never mind. Disappeared again. <laughs> I had it for a second. I saw the live video <laughs> for just a little itty bitty second. Okay, here we go. 
Ah, all right, now I can see comments on Facebook. Oh, and volume's up. Okay. Sherry, you love making pumpkin anything. I agree, I love pumpkin. One of my friends just did a poll on Instagram last week and asked what people's least favorite food were, and pumpkin pie was in the top 10. I can't even believe it. Um, uh, Cheo, hi, new to your channel. Greetings from California. Welcome, I'm so glad you found me. Herit Herit, hello from Germany. Your name is Nicole, and you love my recipes. Thank you so much, Nicole. I'm so glad that you're here. Um, you love to watch my, it's only, it's 1 a.m. there, but you love my live videos. You are seriously so sweet. Um, I am usually up till two, so hopefully you're a late night person as well. This just isn't special. All right, let's check on our purple now. Whew, the glass gets really hot. So, and look at that. Now it's stirring really nicely. It's still a little chunky. That is fine, just keep stirring and it will smooth right out. And that's one of the things with uh, with chocolates and candies. You don't want to burn it, you don't want to over melt it. When you pull it out, it should still actually be a little chunky because um, as you stir it, the heat will distribute and will help smooth it out. All right, so now we're gonna plop the purples. And this is eight ounces of each color. Also, if you're on Facebook, you can click over to a printable recipe of all of these recipes that we're making today. If you're on YouTube, all the recipes are in, um, are in the description box. All right, go back through, add the rest of the other colors where I feel like it needs it. and get all of that goodness out of the jar. It's always sad when you're watching recipe videos and people like don't scrape all the way. You're just like, oh no, all that goodness is sitting there in the bowl. Makes me sad. Sometimes I do it in my edited videos just because you're trying to get the video nice and smooth. I go back and I scrape it later. But obviously when we are live, it's a little different story. All right, so finally let's come back to the purple. I like doing it in kind of two stages like that. Do half of every color and then go back through. Um, it's easier to see places that maybe need to be filled um, when, you, when you do it that way. All right, put all these in the sink. All right, now the next thing, the next thing you want to do is you want to get this as smooth as possible. You could start swirling now, but that's going to be a real mess, and you don't want to spread it with a spatula because that will muddy the colors too much. So this is going to be loud. Just warning you now. You just want to shake that real good. I'm going to turn it the other way too because I tend to shake kind of directionally. Trying to get that spread a little bit. All right, so next up, we want to now do our swirls. So, you can do big swirls like this. And that kind of helps give you your initial swirls. But I don't like to just leave it like this chevroni. Um, especially since it's Halloween, I tend to then come in and anywhere where I see a chunk of one color, I'm going to kind of personalize those swirls a little bit and bring in kind of rounded shapes to this. All right, that's good. Don't over swirl or you will totally muddy the colors up together. All right, now we're going to shake again to get this flat and smooth again because see now it has all these ridges in it. And then you can also see all the bubbles that are coming up as we do this. You don't want to stop right now with all these half popped bubbles. You want to make sure you get all the bubbles up. Okay. That is great. It's spread really nicely, which means it's gonna be nice and thin, not too thick. 
and we have some really great swirls in here. At this point, like over here, it feels a little purpley. I could go back in and swirl this more and then shake it again, but overall it looks good, so I'm gonna leave it. One of the tricks to sprinkling things on items and getting an even distribution is to sprinkle higher. If you sprinkle down low, you get clumps. Um, so again, I like to sprinkle a little bit higher to get uh, smoother. And this works also when you're spicing foods as well. There's a reason that Emerald always like does his bam from up high. It's because it distributes that way better than just pouring a little bit of clump into uh, at the end of your food and you're adding the seasonings. You definitely want to go from higher. All right. So start with the balls. Try to make sure that you get it nice and even. Again, you can always come back and add more later. So I kind of tend to do a little bit of each thing and then add them multiple, multiple times. The other thing that adding it from nice and high does for you is it actually also kind of the uh, it's come the sprinkles are coming in from a higher distance and so they tend to kind of plop down in and stay in the chocolate a little bit better instead of just like sticking to the top um, sometimes the bigger sprinkles like the pumpkin heads don't get evenly distributed so i'll kind of come in and add a couple of those more strategically placed all right so now i'm going to come in with my uh, with my white ghosts. Um, and again, because they're bigger, I'm kind of plopping them a little bit more strategically. Uh -huh. So fun. Have you guys seen any fun sprinkles? It seems like sprinkles are just getting more and more fun, I swear. All right, now our skulls. Try not to mess with it too much once it's down. Um, if it's a little bit sideways, just leave it. If like, see like that pumpkin right there is sideways. If I try to fix that, I would cause more problems than I was fixing by getting in there. So I'm just gonna leave it. Now we're gonna come in with our eyes. Oh, <laughs> when I when I brought the eyes over, one of them came falling out of the ball and fell down. Oh, two eyeballs did. Dang it! See, and this is why you don't want to fix it. Look what I just did. I picked up the eyeball and it left this trail and kind of ruined my swirl. So this upside down eyeball and that upside down eyeball, I'm just gonna leave. Arg, and go for it. This is one of the few times my nails comes in handy. I can hold on to, oh, uh, never mind. I was gonna say I can hold on to these nicely, but they keep sticking to my finger and coming in upside down. <laughs> oh my word, it takes talent to get all so many eyeballs upside down in one shot. Usually I can do a pretty good job at this. Anyway, so this is how you make bark. And then what you want to do next is you just want to leave it. Just let it sit, let it harden up again. Um, and you can use any candies or sprinkles that are in the colors that you're going for, All right? Oh, I have little itty bitty eyeballs too. Make sure we get some of those in there. I am down to the last of my eyeballs I need to find some more and buy them. All right, so this is what this looks like now. Let's do a top shot so you can see it. All right, including my little one that made a huge mess over here. Um, so we're just gonna take that out. Do not put it on like a warm stove or anything like that. Obviously we want this to set, not remelt. All right. Really quickly, before I show you the finished one, I'm gonna show this. So this is that sugar that has been boiling. We're up to um, 200 degrees. So I'm just gonna keep boiling it because we want this to get to a hard, hard crack stage. But that's doing good. Anyway, and then here, 
is uh, the swirl that my assistant made for me earlier today. And as you can see, it's completely set up now. So to break it, you have a couple different options. You can use a knife and cut triangles, or of course, you can just come in here and just break it yourself, right? I will say if you just uh, break it yourself, it tends to break along the swirl lines, so you don't necessarily get really sharp edges. So I kind of do, um, do a mix of both. I'll bring in my knife, um, and I'll make some big cuts, and then I'll come into those big cuts and break more, break it up more shard-like. Um, just watch out when you're coming in here with your knife for those big sprinkles that we've used, because you don't want to have to like try to cut a pumpkin right through the center, right? This is easier if you pull it out and put it on a cutting board, <laughs> which is what I should have done. But I did not. And these lights tend to be really warm, so it can be hard to get the chocolate completely set. But um, yeah. It's easier if you don't swipe. See all the crumbs that I got? It's easier if you just do nice, even chops you'll get better results that way. Um, anyway, so that will give you the shards that you want. So I have this big shard right here in the middle and as I even as I just went to pick it up, it started to break, right? And so then you can break this as much or as little as you want. So that is chocolate bark. Easy peasy. Alright, so now I'm going to bring my, oh, first I'm going to wipe it down because we got a mess. All that chocolate all over the counter. So clean that up between recipes. And let's go back to the candied apples. So I'm going to bring my burner over here so we can see everything. Leave that on while this is heating up. Um, now, so something to remember when it comes to, uh, to candy thermometers and recipes that you're bringing up to temperature. I say this all the time, but for those of you who are new, you need to high altitude adjust your recipes depending on where you live. So I live at 4,500 feet above sea level. Now there are a lot of places online where you can just find what they recommend you change it to, but I find it best because of your own individual thermometer that you'll be working with to do it yourself. So water boils at 212 degrees at sea level. So go ahead and boil some water, use your thermometer, and see at what it boils for for you and I just got a new thermometer so you should do it every time you get a new thermometer because it will be um, each thermometer will be a little bit different so uh, 212 degrees for me the water boiled at 192 degrees which is a 20 degree difference so when this recipe calls um, for you to heat it up to don't remember it off the top of my head um, 310 degrees I'm really going for 290 degrees. And I also turn off the heat before it hits 310 because it will continue to heat up. I take it off the heat at 300, so 280 for me. So just remember, anytime that you're working with recipes, that calls for a temperature to make sure that you are adjusting for where you live. If you live at sea level, all recipes should be written for you and you shouldn't have to make any adjustments at all. If you live higher than me or lower than me, you'll have to adjust uh, differently. So even if I just lived another 500 feet higher, it would probably be a little bit different. So, all right. Uh, now, while that is cooking, we're going to prep the rest of the ingredients. So I have, um, I have some apples. Now I went with red, red, red apples because I feel like they look really good, uh, more snow whitish. 
but obviously go with whatever apple you like the flavor of. Usually I'll get like gala for my kids. The other thing that I like to look for um, is, making sure I can see the temperature. Um, the other thing that I like to look for is apples that will sit flat. I know that it's not um, always easy to find, but I test my apples and make sure that they're going to stand good because if it was an apple that didn't want to stand and was just going to fall over, I don't want to use that because then that's, as I dip the apple and then I set it on the parchment paper, I want it to stay upright. I don't want to have an apple ending up on the side. So look for ones that have really nice sturdy bottoms. Just a small little tip there. We're getting some steam, so I'm going to bring in a fan. Blow that away from my cameras. Um, all right, so then you want to make sure you wash your apples really good. You want to get any coating off your apples because if there's any coating left on your apples, obviously the candy is going to have a much harder time sticking to it. And then another thing that I recommend are uh, getting really good skewers. Uh, this is like a Dell skewer, and they sell them anywhere where you can get like candy making supplies or caramel apple supplies and you want to stick it into your apple really good. Now I have seen some really beautiful uh, pictures of candied toffee apples like this where they use actual branches. That's fine. Uh, you just want to make sure that they're nice and strong because you don't want to be dipping your apple and have it fall off the skewer. Um, and you also want to make sure that you have cleaned them so that they are safe to put in your food. These are of course very food safe. So find the center of your apple and just push your skewer down into it so that you have a nice handle for dipping. Do that for all of your apples. I like to push them down, I don't know, probably about, they kind of, it kind of hits a point. You push through and you kind of, it kind of like hits a point and that's where I stop. Um, it's hard to explain, but once you do it, you like, you feel it. Anyway, stop there. Um, all right. Uh, Remy, uh, hello from Queens, New York. Hello. C. Gomez, hello from Puerto Rico. Angela, hello from Holly Springs, Georgia. Broke Baker, better late than ever. You really haven't missed much. Welcome, welcome. Uh, Kelly, you love my live shows from Ohio. Thank you for joining us. Uh, yes, but you have to wake up at 6 to prepare your kids. I have to wake up at 6 too, and I usually don't go to bed till 2 or 3, so I feel your pain. Uh, but I'm, thank you for watching. I'm glad you enjoyed the videos. All right, so... Uh, we are getting closer. As you can see we have a nice boil going. Now because we're candy making, um, I'm making sure not to scrape the sides of the pans back into the sugar. Because what that would do is, see how it's staying crystallized on the side? If I kept scraping that in, that will reintroduce crystallized sugar into our mixture and it will stay crystallized. So we don't want to do that. If you want to get rid of those, because you do want to be able to stir, uh, Paste your brush. What you want to do is take a, a silicone pastry brush and some water and just brush around the sides with that water and that will help dissolve that without reintroducing crystallized chunks of crystallized sugar in, into your into your thing. Oh, this is really crystallized over here. I really stirred it good over on this side, probably when I moved the pan over. Um, anyways, yeah, you just want to make sure that you're not scraping the sides. So I'm going to keep going around now that I've started. All right, because we're going to be adding some flavor and some color to this as well. So again, as I mentioned before, um, you want to make sure you're using oil base. So this is not my normal black food dye. Shake it up real good. It separates. Um, this is my gel food dye, but this is my oil food dye specifically for candy making because it's, um, yeah, it works better for candy making to use oil based ingredients. So I have my black oil based dye and then I have all of these, uh, different candy flavors. The brand that I really like to use is this uh, Loran. Let's see. Come on, there we go. Loran oils. So uh, I have a ton of different flavors 
So I'm trying to decide what I want to do. I tend to do cinnamon with these apples, um, but I have a lot of fun flavors. I have licorice and marshmallow and cotton candy um, and coconut and mint and amaretto um, and yeah, all the good stuff. So like I said, you can leave it plain and it will just be candy flavored, right? Sugar flavored. Um, but if you want something else, like I said, I like to add cinnamon sometimes. Um, I like to do that. Let's see. I actually just ran out of cinnamon, so maybe we'll try coconut, see how coconut goes with this. Um, let's see, let me catch up on Facebook. David, hello, welcome, thanks for watching. Uh, Lauren, gosh, you were really there, you watch that show all the time. <laughs> Halloween Baking Championship, it's a really fun one, huh? Uh, Emily, hello, Teresa, hello, thanks for sharing. Margaret, welcome, you love popcorn balls, I do too, but I have made popcorn balls so many times, I can't really get away with doing it anymore. Uh, Tony, you wish Halloween was bigger in Australia. I was just in uh, one of my uh, girl travel groups. Somebody was just talking about how they were coming from Australia to Disney, um, and they were coming at Halloween time, so they could hit all the Halloween stuff. Super fun. Um, David and Christy, welcome. Thanks for watching, but you're a sweet feet, so maybe not. Uh, you could always come visit for Halloween, then you don't have to celebrate it every single year. Uh, your favorite meal is to make mummy corn dogs. Lovely. Um, I love doing that. Um, as a Halloween meal or as a Mexican dinner. Barbara, hello. Margaret, so pretty. You love it. Alicia, hi, my college freshman roommate. Uh, coconut, yes, we will try that. All right, so, ooh, we got Facebook comments finally working. Put that off to the side. It's like all entangled in my cords now, of course. Uh, and it's not turning over, so. Can't read comments upside down. Let's try that again. There we go. Um, okay. So our temperature now, we are up to the softball stage. We just need a little bit longer to go. Now it's funny, when you are cooking with sugar and making uh, uh, like toffees and other things like that, you, you really wanna make sure that you're staying in your kitchen and you're watching because like right now it's going really slow. It's taken us a couple minutes to go from 20 to, to from 200 degrees to 240 degrees. But as it gets hotter, it goes faster and faster and faster, and you don't want to miss it. What you don't want to do is like walk away or make the, the batter for the uh, pumpkin cakes and then come back and have it be 400 degrees and have everything be burnt. So you definitely want to make sure that you watch it. You also don't want to add the flavoring or the color too soon. Uh, now, because this isn't alcohol-based, it's oil-based, you don't have to worry about it evaporating as it cooks like you do with alcohol-based flavors. Um, also, these flavors are really, really strong, so you don't, I wouldn't like use a teaspoon. You use drops of these, uh, of these oil-flavored candies because they are so strong. That's why they also come so small. When I first got one, I was like, oh, I'm so jip. This is so teeny tiny. Um, but yes, it's very concentrated, so a little goes a long way. And when I open it, it will, the smell will just bloom everywhere. All right, so like I was talking about, it just went up 10 degrees just while we were talking, right? So... It's amazing how fast it goes. So this should just take a couple more minutes. Um, here is what it is looking like now. Now it is getting a lot darker and more yellow. One of the things that you can do to avoid that is instead of using tap water, you can use um, not drinking water, the other one, uh, distilled. You can use distilled water and it won't go as yellow. So that's a tip if you're trying to go for a, a clearer look. One of the things that you can do is you can add white food dye and what what food dye will do is it will take it from opaque to to sturdy so i'm going to add this black but it's still going to be a clear black if i wanted it to be a pure black that you can't like see through then you could add white food dye and that's what that does and it is awesome i use it for all the time i use it in my um my worm video uh when we're using uh gelatin and juice to make jello jiggler worms uh, they'd be clear and transparent if I didn't add that white food dye. So there's another trick for you for candy making. When I'm making, uh, oh, we're already up another 10 degrees. When I make my, uh, I make handmade suckers all the time for different parties and different events. So again, if I want it to be clear, like the snowflake suckers I made for my frozen party, you just leave it and add the coloring that you want. Uh, but remember, you will be battling with that yellowish shade. So make sure, if you want to go clear, 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 then you want to make sure that you're using distilled water. Um, all right, we're getting close, so I'm going to go ahead and um, add the coloring and stir that in. So usually I wait till I'm uh, 10 degrees away and I take it off the heat and I let it continue to warm up while I add this stuff, but we're getting to the point that I'm just going to go for it. Uh, the last little bit of prep that you want to do 
is you want to make sure that you have another tray with parchment paper or Zilpat mat in it to immediately put your apples on. Um, I'm also going to make sure that I put a trivet underneath it so that it doesn't burn my counter as I add those hot apples. So let's move this to the side and bring this in. Make sure we have room for that. All right. Oh, I almost knocked one of the apples off. You don't want to make sure that you don't have bruised apples either. You want them to be nice and firm without any blemishes. Um, okay, so I'm going to... Oh, we hit soft crack, so we're there. Uh, I just hit the temperature that I was going for, 280 degrees. So I'm turning the heat off. I'm going to... I told you, it happens so fast. Like, we just hit another 12 degrees when I wasn't even, like, working, when I was prepping. All right, so I'm going to take it off the heat. I'm going to put a trivet down as well for that. And we'll continue to uh, heat up the last 10 degrees while I'm doing all of this. One of the things you can do if it, if let's say you went a little bit too long and it's at the perfect temperature right now and I don't want it to continue to get 10 degrees hotter, what you can do in that case um, is you can actually take your pot over to your sink and immediately, and you can either put this right in an ice bath or I like to just run cold water around it. Obviously you have to make sure you have good quality pans for that uh, so that you're not pouring cold water onto a hot pan. That could be a mess. All right. So I'm going to add, open up my flavoring. Oh, that smells amazing. So I don't want to just pour it in that would be a mess. I'm getting, I have a little dropper that I like to use. Oh no, I can't find my dropper. All right. I don't want to take any more time. So since I don't have a dropper, but I also don't want to pour it in just in case it gets too much, you can see how that oil is thicker. So, all right, I'm just going to do it into this spoon. The other thing you can't really do is you can't really um, taste test, right? Because this is so stinking hot. If I tried to taste test this, I would burn myself really badly. So once you, once you pick it, you're, you're, you're stuck with it until it cools down and you can try it. All right. Now, oh, and notice I'm leaving my thermometer in. The reason for that um, is so I can continue to watch that temperature grow. Because if I do hit that extra 10 degrees and it's still getting hot, then I'm going to want to um, run that, do that trick with the cold water. All right, so I did a nice big squirt of the black, but as you can see, it's still transparent black. All right, and as I'm stirring it, I'm trying to make sure that I'm not over mixing it because I don't want it to get super bubbly. Um, although that does kind of look cool on the apples. Um, all right, so that is all mixed up. We have hit the temperature that I want, and it started to cool down, so I don't have to worry about the thermometer anymore. Pull that out. And now we're going to uh, dip our first apple. Now, if I just dip it straight in, that only goes in like an inch, right? So you can either use the spatula that's in here to get this higher, right? That's always a possibility. Or what I like to do is actually take the pan and rotate it to the side and just swirl the apple in it and then pull it out and let it drip. Now this is a really cool effect and it's so shiny I can like see myself in it. Can you guys see me right there? Yeah. A really cool effect. So I want to let it drip for a good amount of time so I don't get puddling, but I also don't want to let it drip so long that I, um, I lose the ability to drip my other apples. So then I scrape the bottom off and I bring it over here to parchment paper. So I'm going to do it again. Tilt it to the side. Now you can go all the way up um, and cover the top. I am not because... Um, I like seeing some of the apple. This is the effect that I that I like. And as this cools, 
um, the, the, it will start to set and it will start to get hard. So uh, you can leave it on the heat and leave it on like a low to try to maintain temperature. That can be a hard game to play. So um, it's not always the best option. Look at that nice shine. Isn't that pretty? So pretty. Now when I was dipping this one, I felt the skewer inside start to turn. That's why I'm not holding this perfectly upright. I'm trying to keep that skewer in there. All right, and this makes enough to dip like four to six apples. Um, so kind of just depending on how fast you work or how many apples you've bought. But I can feel it starting to get sticky already. There we go. Also depending on how much you cover. So there's kind of a time frame. You do want to work fast um, when you're working with hot sugars and dipping like this. Now you could also take this exact same mixture. This is what I use to make homemade suckers. So it's also great for pouring into like molds if you have silicone molds that you like to use. But again, you want to work quickly. All right, so that is our candied apples. Let's move the camera so you can see them better. All right, so then these, you can see it's already starting to kind of get a little bit of extra dripping going on, but not too bad. Um, you just want to let these sit until they harden completely. Now this one was the last one that I did, so it was the mixture was still a little bit stirred up. And you can see all the, bu the air bubbles that it got. Uh, my apples, half, half the time do this, half the time don't. I don't know if it's the apple or the mixture. Um, but I actually kind of like it for the poisoned apple look, so it doesn't bother me. But if, I, if it did bother me, you can, while this is still warm, you can actually take a kitchen torch and heat that, and those will pop and go away, and you'll have a smooth finish. So this kind of depends on what effect you're looking for. So now I'm going to take these and put them off to the side. And I'm not on that hot thing. I'm running out of space. All right. So I'm going to clean up, put stuff away so it's out of the way. We're going to bring all the ingredients over now to make, um, make the pumpkin. So... This is actually the same recipe that I use for my pumpkin bread, my pumpkin cake, and my pumpkin cupcakes. This is a super versatile recipe. I like it because it's sweet enough to be cake and cupcakes, but it's also not too sweet. So I actually use the same recipe for breads and muffins. Um, if I just add chocolate chips to them, and then I'll have pumpkin muffins that are great for breakfast and my kids love. So it's a really versatile recipe. I really love it, and it's really easy to mix up. So... That is what we're going to do now. Bringing all the dry ingredients over. That's the only problem with making so many recipes at once. I can't just have everything uh, close at hand. So, All right, so this is one that's great because you mix all the dry ingredients, including uh, the sugar, um, all at once. You don't have to worry about creaming the butter or anything like that. So... Um, well, let's get everything in frame. So I have my uh, all-purpose flour. And like I said, I add the sugar into this as well. Um, let's add all of our spices. All right, so I have a lot of spices. So I'm opening up all the jars. <laughs> Hold on a second. Okay. Okay, so it is baking, some baking soda, some powder. Now the other thing is I high altitude all of my baking as well. Uh, I do one cup less, uh, sorry not one cup, <laughs> I do a tablespoon less sugar for every cup, a tablespoon more flour for every cup. For leavening ingredients I do um, one eighth teaspoon less for every teaspoon. All right so we have the salt, 
And now we have the nutmeg and cloves. Cloves are a strong one. So um, I tend to do a lot less than even a If a normal recipe calls for a lot of cloves, I do less. I always make sure that the cloves are about a half or a quarter of the other spices because it is, for me, a really strong, a really strong flavor. Um, and then finally cinnamon. And we're going to whisk this together. bring all of that together so I love I love the flavor of cloves but I always I make sure that I don't ever go too strong we're gonna put that off to the side let's put all of our spices away try to keep our work area as less messy as possible Now we're going to do our wet ingredients. So, half of my wet ingredients are in the fridge. So just a second. Pumpkin. That is all. All right. So, now we have... Um, there's my spatula. All right, so I have some pumpkin. Now you can use your own homemade pumpkin puree if you have some. Um, I have some, but I forgot to get it out of the freezer. So we're using canned pumpkin puree, uh, eggs, um, water, and of course, one of my favorites for cupcakes and cakes, and that is uh, mayo. So mayo is just eggs and oil together, um, but I like using it in cakes. I feel like it gives it a creamier finish. Um, so yeah, but you, if you don't have mayo, you can just use more uh, oil and eggs together. And I'm gonna take that same whisk, cause no reason to get another one dirty. Pop my eggs. And mix it until it is Nice and smooth. Usually I do the dry ingredients in the big bowl and the wet ingredients in the smaller bowl. I was just not paying attention. So typically I pour the wet ingredients over the dry. Okay, so super easy. But since I did the wrong bowls, we'll pour the dry over the wet. It will be, it will be okay. This is one of those recipes you can't really mess up. Now you can get your hand mixer out to mix for this final mixing. I just find that I don't need it. Um, and so I don't, I don't usually bother. It usually just takes a little bit of muscle. Now if I was doing muffins, I would leave it pretty chunky like this. Because for muffins, you don't want to stir things all the way together. Um, but for cake, I'm going to get it a little bit smoother. All right. There we go. And now, uh, for this, for these ghosts, I'm using the mini Wonder Mold pans because this is the shape that we're going for. This is going to be our ghost. So uh, use cake goop or nonstick spray. I always spray over the sink so I don't make a mess in my kitchen. And make sure you give it a nice coating. Um, <coughs> whew, I got some spray in my mouth. Now for ease and cleanliness, I always use a scoop. This is the size I use for cupcakes or muffins. For these though, you're gonna do, um, you're gonna do a couple. I do like two and a half or two that are overflowed. And this will make like six big ones, which is perfect for my family, so that's what I do. But you could always spread them, make them a little bit smaller, and just and do um, uh, and do and you can get eight that way because each of these pans fits four. Now, if you're only doing six, 
you want to make sure, so I have two of these pans, if you're only doing six, you want to make sure that the ones that you're not putting batter in, you put water in before you put them in the oven. So I'm going to put this off to the side because I'm not actually cooking them right now because I already did. I have some finished ones ready to go. And I got pumpkin all over my hand. <laughs> all right. All right, so I have some that I already finished and that I cooled and then I wrapped in plastic to keep them nice and fresh. So I'm going to find the end and unwrap these. <laughs> if I can find the end. Okay, so. Them on little plates and then they're little individual cakes you can also put them on like little cupcake stands as well that will work too so uh, they come out and they look um, they look like this and they've domed up now obviously that's we want this side of the cake so what I need to do is level this just take a serrated knife and I don't level it all the way to here because I want to save as much cake as I can. I just give it enough level that it will be able to sit on the plate flat. Like that. All right? Then I can put that on the plate. Again, you can level as much as you want, but I like to maintain the height. Um, I'm just trying to make it flat enough to stand on its own. Now, if you have cooled yours upside down on a cooling rack and they have become flat, then you can skip this step if you want. And I always, I wait to level until um, right before I'm ready to finish them off because this plate is going to help keep it moist and I don't want that drying out. And this is a very moist cake. All right, perfect. So, as you can see... It's beautiful, so good. Now, a reminder, no so good. If you're using, um, mm -hmm, too big of a bite. Uh, if you're using homemade pumpkin puree that you have made with a sugar pumpkin, it's more yellow than orange. So the color will be a little bit different. So just, just a reminder. Um, also remember that um, the canned pumpkin you get in the store is actually not pumpkin. It's a type of squash, Libby's, uh, which is like 78% of the canned pumpkin sold in the world. 75%? 85%? 85%. I'm trying to remember my stats off the top of my head. Um, and they, um, they actually have invented their own pumpkin that they use. Uh, that's really large. They can get more pumpkin out of it and has a really thick meat. And the outside is actually not orange at all. The outside is actually kind of whitish. It has a really thin skin, so it's easy for them to take off. Um, so they have their own, their own brand of pumpkin or their own uh, of squash. It's really close related to like a butternut squash. Um, but the inside is nice and orange, and that's where we get that great color that we're used to. So okay, just a funny, funny side note. All right, so now we're going to make the frosting. So of course, cream cheese frosting, come on, there we go, is the way to go. So cream cheese and butter. And I'm going to get out my hand mixer for this one. Now if they're room temperature, they should beat together really quickly and easily and really smoothly. Now we're gonna add our powdered sugar, powdered sugar cloud, and of course, some vanilla. And this is, in like all my videos, I always get a nice pretty teaspoon out, but in real life, I just eyeball my vanilla. In fact, in real life, I eyeball most of my spices. When it comes to baking, I'm more precise, but like cook cooking in general. 
I just use the palm of my hand. Now it starts to look really thick at first and you have all this powdered sugar left over on the sides and it's really tempting to add milk at this point, but don't. Just trust me, just keep going. Um, hey, Emily, it's good to see you. Or, you know, read you. <laughs> uh, Margaret, you love everything pumpkin. I agree so much. So just keep going, and as you beat it and mix it, and you get all that powdered sugar in, it will it will come together. Look how much smoother it looks already. It just needs time. Um, if you don't like the powdered sugar flying everywhere, um, you can always, what you can do is you can kind of fold that powdered sugar in a little bit with a spatula, and then beat it, and that will kind of cut down on your powdered sugar clouds. I usually just let powdered sugar fly, but that's because powdered sugar is flying around is pretty much a staple every day, so why fight it? All right, look at how good and creamy and delicious that looks. I like, I don't like adding too much extra to my um, cream cheese frosting, so cream cheese, Good amount of butter, powdered sugar, vanilla, period. Oh, so delicious. All right, now we're going to frost our cake. Um, now, uh, I recommend a frosting spatula. One more thing I forgot to get out. It's funny, as much prep as I do for these videos, how much this still gets forgotten. Um, so if you want, you can frost the bottom as well. That will help it stick to the plate. And while I'm holding it, I will kind of frost that whole bottom section because um, that'll make it easier. The smaller a cake is and the lighter it is, actually the harder it is to frost because as you, you don't have anything like fighting against you, right? There's no, there's no weight fighting you as you do this. Um, so I try to have like keep my finger on it as long as I can to kind of give myself that um, something to kind of push against. Now because we're going to be covering these with a layer of fondant and because we're making ghosts, it does not have to be pretty. You just want it to be somewhat evenly covered. And we want to maintain that kind of most ghostly dome shape if possible. All right. First one, first one done. And now I'm going to, act, uh, I'll do another one real fast. Let me see, I'll move on to, um, to the fondant, but I'll really quickly do another one just so we have two ghosts at the end that we can put faces on. And if you want, of course, you can dye the cream cheese frosting, but because we're putting white fondant over it to make our ghosts, I find that just leaving it cream cheese colored is, um, it is best. But you could, of course, like dye it red, and then when you cut into your little ghost cakes, you have a bleeding ghost, but... I don't know. I'm not really into too much gore. I'm more of a cutesy Halloween person. So that's just, that's just me. When I was on Halloween Food Network, the judges kept saying, we want more blood. We want more gore. And I'm like, I don't think, I don't think I'm their favorite person. <laughs> I, I've got kids. I, I, I like the cute aspect of Halloween. I don't do haunted houses. I don't do scary movies. I am a big, fat, wimpy baby. I 100% admit that. I don't find any joy in being scared whatsoever. All right. Let's set that aside. Okay. I'm going to 
wipe down the counter again. Because that is what we do. To prep my surface for working with fondant, I'm going to take some shortening. This is a really cheap brand of shortening I'm trying to use up, and it's not good to use for recipes because it's so nasty. Um, I recommend name brand shortbread, bread, but it works okay for cakes. So, oh, oh, look, I broke my measuring cup. I hit it with my rolling pin. Oh, woe is me. You don't have, we even want to know how many glass measuring cups I go through. I want to say of this, of this size, I should throw it away before it gets worse. Um, I think that's my fifth one this year. <laughs> um, but it's such a great size. I keep buying them. All right, so I have some fondant that I've already cut off my fondant block. And I've already pre-kneaded, but I'm going to knead it again real fast. Um, even though I needed it just, what, half an hour ago, right before we started? Okay. The, just to make sure it's nice and pliable, and it'll get a little bit warm for my hands, it'll be easier to roll out. All right, so. Now, because we're going to be cutting out circles out of this, you do not have to worry about maintaining a shape at all. You just have to main, worry about um, keeping it nice and even. All right, and last week when we were doing fondant, I talked about one of my tricks. Sometimes when you're kneading your fondant quickly, you'll get some air bubbles in there. Like I have some air bubbles here right now. So you want to deal with air bubbles before, uh, before you roll it out to the thinness that you want to go to. So I kind of push the air bubble so it's full on one side, and I come in with a sharp needle at an angle and then I press the rest of the air out. And the reason for that is when you come in at an angle and come out, it's easy to hide that hole. See how that hole's gone now? Where if I came in from the top and created a hole straight down, no amount of rubbing is gonna get rid of that hole because that hole continues all the way down, right? So by putting the hole at an angle, you're actually making it easier to hide, to hide it later. So. Anywhere where you think you might have a bubble, go ahead and do that now. When it's about halfway to the thickness that you're looking for, that is the time to fight, to fight the bubbles. Oh, I have another one I missed. Uh, so usually when I'm working with cakes, I like to get my fondant about uh, a quarter of an inch thick. And the reason for that is that at that thickness I can press the fondant back into itself or I can I can still stretch it out to fit whatever shape I'm creating like last week we did the Mickey jack-o-lantern cake um so a quarter of an inch is really good is what I find I like to work with um some people like it more some people like it less people who love fondant quarter of an inch is not thick enough for them people who hate fondant quarter of an inch is too thick so it's kind of a nice medium where nobody's really happy <laughs> Um, but it's a nice in-between as well. But for this, I actually want ripples. I want these ghosts to look draped and ripply. Um, and I, I don't love fondant myself. So, um, whoop. man, I had some dust bunnies on this thing. I got some little dust flecks on my fondant. Um, yeah, so thin is fine for this because I'm not molding the fondant to a specific cake. So for this, I'll go about half thickness, another air bubble. I'll go like about more like an eighth of an inch. All right, almost there. All right. So I've gotten this, let's pull it back. There we go. I've gotten this nice and thin. Not thin enough that it's see-through, but see how well that ripple just even right there while I was working with the fondant. All right, so 
I like to take a round plate, about six or seven inches, uh, place it down, get a knife, a sharp knife, and as smoothly as possible, one move if you can, cut around the plate. And pick the plate up, move it over here, and we will do it again. Um, there we go. All right, now I'm going to bring back my little frosted, my little frosted domes, and take away the excess fondant. Make sure that you knead it back together, and if you're not going to be using it again right away, um, wrap it back in a plastic, in layers and layers of plastic to keep it fresh. You do not want to let your fondant dry out. Okay. Oh my word, you guys, I am way behind on comments. Um... Okay, so uh, I'm going to pick the fondant top and I'm going to kind of find that center right there and put it right over the center of my dome and lay that down. Now, hold on, switching cameras. All right, so now I want this to be more ripply and ghost-like, so, but I kind of want the ripples to be more even. So I'm gonna come in here and kind of add the ripples where I want them. Now if I've cut this properly, it will just kind of hit the bottom of the, of the plate like this. You can always cut a smaller circle if you need to, kind of depending on your plate. If I was using a cupcake stand and this was lifted a little bit higher, that would be a little bit different. In fact, let me go get that. I have a cute little cupcake stand. So you can see what that looks like. Okay. Cute little cupcake stand. Uh, one of the other things that I like to do is after I frost them and while I'm rolling out the fondant, I like to put the cakes in the fridge and that will help the cream cheese frosting set and will um, make it a little bit easier to work with. All right. Find the center of my fondant and bring it down. So I would rather have more ripples than less. So I'm going to come in here and add ripples more often. Like that. There we go. All right, let's see how cute. You do want to make sure that you have just a little bit of smoothness so you have an area to, um, I'm going to add another ripple in between here. So I have kind of a place for my face to go. All right, so now for drawing the faces, you have a couple different options. Uh, you can, oh, oh, wrong one. <laughs> I didn't think I'd switch the camera. Uh, you can use the edible markers. They have edible markers, but I find that when I'm working with fresh fondant like this and I'm using the edible marker, it tends to just push into the fondant versus really draw on it, especially with that squishy, um, cream cheese frosting underneath versus like a ganache that's firmer. It's going to give you a better base. So I tend to not use the edible pens for this. So if you have um, airbrush paint, this is already paint level. It's perfect, really easy to use. I recommend going with that. If you don't have airbrush paint, but you do have like gel paste, go ahead and use that. What you're going to want to do is take 
first, don't forget to shake it up. <laughs> I want to use just a drop or two. A little goes a long way. Now painting with this would be too thick, so you want to water this down, but you can't use water, so you, you want to use some kind of alcohol. So clear vanilla works great, or um, vodka works really well too. And again, just add a little bit at a time. Go ahead and stir that together. And you're looking for a paint-like consistency, right? Try not to touch it. <laughs> You will get paint everywhere. And then just take a paintbrush. Now I only use this paintbrush for food. So make sure that you have a paintbrush that you're only using for food. And go ahead and create uh, whatever ghost face you're looking to create. Sorry, I hold my breath when I'm doing detailed stuff. Now this is one of those things oops, that my kids really like to do. So I will have like these all finished for them today and then they'll come in and they'll paint their own face on their own ghost cupcake. So that's fun for them. They really like doing that. Um, and yeah, just have just have fun with it. Do whatever you like to do for faces. I always like to do at least um, one wink. Oh, that did not. That does not look like a wink. It looks like a leaf. I'm shaking. <laughs> I just got a paper towel wet with some water. Now that will kind of eat away at the fondant a little bit and leave it kind of shiny in that spot. So you want to make sure you also dry it out. Okay. Let's see if I can do my wink a little bit better this time. You can see how badly I'm shaking. Sorry, I'm back to holding my breath. Okay. <laughs> All right. And there we go. So, to finish up, Everything that we made today, we made chocolate bark, we made candied apples that are now nice and firm. All right, so I guess I should probably eat a little bit of everything. Ooh, look at this. Oh, I broke it. There was a really cool bubble right here, but I hit it against the other. All right, so you can see this one. Let's see. Oh, so this one, come on, focus. This one stayed bubblier. It was one of the, it was our final one, the last one, where it was kind of, it was starting to get harder already. It wasn't quite as loose, where this one was one of the earliest ones that we did. So it's a little bit smoother. As you can see. But I kind of like the bumpy look for the poisoned apple. I think this was the first one actually. See how nice and smooth and shiny it is? Um, and like I said, you can use a kitchen torch while these are still warm to get that out. So let's start with the bark. To be fair, the bark is going to taste like whatever chocolate or candy melts you used. Can't go wrong with chocolate, right? Mm. All right, apple. I will say the one thing about candied apples, it's really hard. 
Um, and if a shard breaks, it can be rough on your gums. So be careful with this. <laughs> Mm. I never really understood why candied apples are a thing, but of course I don't really like apples. Uh, I tend to like caramel apple better, but I do love the effect. I love how cool it looks for Halloween and on a Halloween table, even if nobody ever eats them. Mm. I prefer green apples, but I like the look of the red apples for these. So, all right, now for my cake. Let's... Work a knife. Mm -hmm. Oh, poor little ghosty. I just dug right into him. But. He's gonna be delicious, so it's okay. Mm. So good. White, fluffy, and that cream cheese frosting just doesn't get much better. Personally, I may peel off the fondant person mm. and enjoy the cake without it. But I will lick off the cream cheese frosting. <laughs> but I do love that. All right, so. Next week, uh, next week I was planning on doing three more super easy Halloween treats like this and then I had inspiration. Uh, so you know those fault line cakes that are going around? I came up with an idea for Halloween fault line cake and so I'm gonna make it live next week with, I'm not gonna have made it beforehand I doubt because I'm just too busy. So I won't have a blog post for it, I won't have pictures for it, I will have all of that stuff once I finish the fault line cake uh, after the live video, but we will be, will be an experiment. <laughs> we will see how it goes. So I'm gonna be doing a graveyard fault line cake next Tuesday, um, 3.30 specific time, 6.30 Eastern time, 4.30 my time, mountain time. Um, so join me. I will stay on for just a couple minutes and catch up to all the comments that I have not caught up on. Um, but thank you again for joining me. Thanks for watching. I hope you guys have fun this Halloween, making fun Halloween treats. If you make any of these Halloween treats or any of the other Halloween treats from my, um, from my website, ashleymarie.com, don't forget to uh, tag me, Ashley Marie Cakes, on social media or use the hashtag Ashley Marie Cakes, Ashley Marie Recipes, Ashley Marie Treats, or Make Some Awesome. Uh, I follow all of those, and I would love to share what you create and what you make uh, on my social media. So thanks again for watching and have a great night. All right, so catching up on YouTube comments. Um, let's see, there's a crowd tonight. It's raining today. It looks like a lot of people are having conversation with each other. Uh, broke, you're all about the cute Halloween too. I'm so glad I am not the only one. Um, you too, uh, Angela, being scared is no fun. It really, I just don't get it. Um, when I was younger my parents told me that arachnophobia was a comedy it was my first pg-13 movie i had nightmares for weeks and then um uh, when i was still married we watched what lies beneath once oh i had nightmares for months and i don't ever dream i never dream i only have nightmares um so that's probably one of the reasons i don't like being scared um it's horrible. Any, if I even have a dream or starts turning into a dream, like turns dice, it immediately goes even worse into a terrible nightmare. I had a nightmare when I was six that my sister got killed in front of me and it was my fault and I have never liked scary ever since then. It totally affected me. Um, so yeah, I, I do not purposely scare myself. Why would I do that? I already don't sleep very well. <laughs> you don't need to add to that. Um, uh, toy talkers, you too, you have kids, you're all about the cuteness. There's just so much fun you can have with these holidays. And I do have some bloody treats, but even those are more on the cutesy side, not like the gore side. Like I don't do zombies and brains and all of that stuff. There's nothing wrong with it. Um, uh, Angela, do you buy your fondant in bulk? Where do you get it? Yes, I have a local store that sells the brand that I like. I like Satin Ice Fondant. Uh, Fat Daddy-O's Fondant is also a good one. I can get both of those at a local store. Um, you should... Uh, you should be able to find a local place that has them. I highly recommend them. Um, you can always reach out to Sad Nice. They're great on social media, and I bet they could let you know where a local store is that sells it for you. 
Um, Susan, thanks for the great show. Thanks for watching, Susan. Appreciate you coming. Uh, Gabrielle, hi. Love your baking. Thank you so much, Gabrielle. Thanks for coming and for watching. All right, I think... Uh, Margaret, you hold your breath too. I'm glad I'm not the only one. I do it when I cut hair as well. It used to freak people out. Uh, Margaret, you love it all. You can't wait to try it. Thanks so much. And thanks for sharing. Can't wait to see you next week. I can't wait to see you next week as well. So I'm all cut up with the comments. If anybody has any other questions, of course, you can reach out to me on social media. And thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you next week. Have a great weekend. Bye.